Peace, family. It's your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. We're here on the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel. And as always, we are here for night school. That's right. Every Monday to Thursday at 1030 p.m. Eastern time, we do something called night school. It's not a TV show. It's not a podcast. It is an international classroom where we talk about the biggest stories, the biggest ideas, and some of the most interesting people in the world stop through. And we break stuff down. No sound bites, no quick conversations, but a deep analysis, a thoughtful analysis of what is going on in the world. So tonight, we got a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about. We, we're going to be up here for a long time because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. I want to talk about uh, a judge uh, that has ruled that migrant children actually have to be cared for, despite the fact that the federal government has tried to say that it's not their business. We want to talk about what's going on in Mississippi, where bodies are being buried in pauper's graves. Poor people, black people, brown people, their bodies are being buried without their families knowing behind a prison colony. I mean, this is the stuff we're talking about. Louisiana is bringing up a bill that will uh, potentially stop people from protesting. Uh, of course, we know the great uh rap artist if you if you're from my generation g depp brother who don't always get enough credit he's home uh after doing a long stretch in prison we're gonna talk about what that means and why that might be uh significant and of course we'll talk a little bit about gaza uh but of course our full day 181 gaza update will come right after night school we'll have our own conversation about that uh in the meantime i just want to shout out some of the members of the channel of course we got rachel we got rachel here in the building we got sahora alaikum salam we got meg here we got uh, Abel Tesfaye. Uh, I'm assuming that's my Habasha brother. We got Nivia here. Good to see you as always. Change Wave, Rose Ability, good to see you. Uh, MX Samuel, thank y'all. These are all the people who help make this channel possible by being subscribed members. Uh, Chad Zichterman, I appreciate you. Kimi Oboyade Acosta, so good to see you. Dallas is fine. So I only say this about you, Jazz, because I don't, as a Philadelphian, I don't actually like Dallas or people from Dallas, but I appreciate you. Uh, Coyote Hope, thank, shout out to you. Farrah, shout out to you. Um, so many others in the building, but I just want to say a couple more. Karen D, thank you. Bob Vaughn, good to see you. Venetia, uh, Sustenance Bloom, all of y'all, so much love. Odette Marie, Nevia Bella, uh, so many y'all here present for night school. Matter of fact, from now on, when y'all say night school, I want y'all to say that y'all are present. Y'all can drop that in the thing. T Henderson, one of the noobs, always the greatest fraternity known to God and man. I appreciate you there. Yo, yo. Marco therapy so good everybody y'all see here that i'm shouting out as a channel member and if y'all want to be a channel member just hit that join button and you help us sustain independent political education independent media independent radical thought uh and we have all kinds of people up in here bullet the bunny who's doing important work out in gaza right now sakina my sister april so oh god we got royalty in the building april silver is in here that's all i needed to know uh uh l2 uh isha abu amr uh is here olivia garnett we growing so it used to be i have a shout out four or five people man now we got so many people here but thank you all for being channel members thank you all for supporting the channel tonight there's all those stories that i said i wanted to talk to you about but before i do that i want to actually bring up somebody else as you know we also do something on the show called office hours office hours usually is when i come and y'all ask me questions and y'all talk to me about what's going on you break me down you debate me you tell me why i'm wrong you tell me why i'm right you ask me to give more information about something and we try to do office hours at least twice a week but tonight i got a special a special blessing coming not just for y'all but for me uh i have two brothers that i want to bring to the stage right now uh who are extraordinary extraordinary brothers uh extraordinary uh black men extraordinary leaders extraordinary artists extraordinary uh i would just say geniuses man and um I'm, I'm so honored to have them on the show the brother uh to the at the top to my right on the screen is a brother that many of you already know uh and you, you should know him he is one of the great uh rappers of of his generation um he is not just a skilled lyricist and a skilled writer um but he has a musical ear and if you've watched any of the documentaries on on kanye west any of uh any documentaries on the chicago hip-hop scene you know that he is a staple uh in chicago music but in but in the hip-hop culture more broadly but he's not just that he's a leader um he's an organizer he's somebody who saw uh, a crisis and a challenge in his city 
and he didn't check out. He didn't move away. He didn't talk trash. He didn't tell him to pull their pants up. And, 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 and you know what I mean? And, and speak English better. He said, I'm going to invest in my community. I'm going to invest in education. I'm going to do some important work. And that brother's name um, is Rhyme Fest, my dear brother. And I believe you're fasting as well. Is that right? What'd you say? Are, are you fasting right now? Uh, no, I'm not fasting right now. I'm actually, you know, bro, I got type 2 diabetes. Oh. And I'm on another type of special diet to kind of take care of my, my health as as we move into the future oh my god well i'm wishing you yeah. health and wealth on that journey and because that's it's, it's a blessing to find that out and to be able to deal with it in the proper way uh because that's so that's that's so important man i'm, I'm glad to hear um yeah. that you're taking care of you and that you and that you uh that you're on top of that and there's another brother here that i want to introduce you to uh chief ayanda if if Dada clark and correct me if i if i mispronounced uh your name but i think i got it right did i get it right Oga Ifadara, Ifadara. Ifadara, Ayanda Ifadara. I ain't never messing up your name again. I, I believe we got to get each other's name. We got to get anybody's name right, but your name is a blessing and it's beautiful. And I want to make sure um, that I get it right every time. I had never pronounced the, the middle name before, so I'd only seen Absolutely. it really. But uh, for those that don't know, and uh, many people do know him because he is from the People's Republic of Brooklyn. And if you know him in Brooklyn and you know him all over the world, but this brother is a transformative leader. He's not just a transformative leader in the world of music, but also in the world of spirituality, also in the world, also in our communities. He's a Grammy award winning musician. He's performed with everybody. I'm talking about Randy Weston, Erica Badu, George Clinton. Um, I don't know if y'all heard this guy, Michael Jackson. Uh, I'm talking about all the greats. Uh, he's been with so many of them. He's such a, a brilliant voice, but he's also, um, He's also somebody who understands African philosophy. He's somebody who understands African music. He understands the power. And we were talking about this before we came on, the power uh, of the drum and, and what the drum can do and how the drum can connect us to our, our core and our self and our history and our legacy and our ancestors and our gods. What he does and what he's been able to do is extraordinary. And I want to make sure that y'all know about it. So I felt like what to better people to have for my first two guests on night school than YouTube brothers, man. Welcome to the show. I don't even want to call it the show. Welcome to the classroom. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Thank for you for having, having us, bro. Thank you. So a lot of people will be like, all right, I see why Ron Fest is on and I see why Chief Ayanda is on, but I don't see why they on together. What's, what's, what's tell people y'all connection. Well, we first met, Ryan Fest and I first met on, uh, we were doing a panel on reparations. And, and I had, of course, you know, you can't, you can't love hip hop and not know the brother Ryan Fest, but we had never met, right? We had never met. And uh, from that conversation, we had an amazing conversation. Uh, shout out to Akila Work Songs for, for helping to organize that for us. Um, and when we got there together, they, you know when real recognize real? When you look in the mirror and you see your brother, you look across and you see your brother and you see someone who, who gets you. And uh, from that, a, a, a friendship, a relationship sparked. And we, you know, we're the kind of, we're the kind of uh, brothers that we get on a, on a phone that we intend to talk for about 10, 15 <laughs> minutes. And it winds up being like a two hour conversation that is a two, to be continued. So I'm I'm grateful to share space and share share uh, similar mindset with with my good brother Ron Fest. And you know, one of the things I, I would say about the panel we were on, it was a reparations panel. But where I stand on reparations, like I got a line where I say, "I never heard of a thief giving a refund. Ain't no reparations, just Section Eight and a Nissan." So where mm -hmm. I stand on it is, you know, if you get money back from the thief, it's a trick. And, you know, so when we talk about reparations, what I, I think it's it's often misguided. We should really be talking about how to take power back, not how to ask for um, a, a bit of our merchandise back and, because whole power was taken. And when we look at reparations on a global scale, for in my perception, it has a lot to do with international interests. So when you look at why did Jewish people get reparations? Well, look at the strategic place that Israel is in and how their relationship is with our country or Japanese or anyone 
who got reparations. So, and even when we look at uh, native indigenous reparations, it's not all what it was supposed to be cracked up to be. It didn't heal the wound. So what are we as black, uh, as, as people of the diaspora, what are we expecting in terms of justice from asking this government to repair the harm? And so, you know, it's easy for now, are you saying people. that we should manage our expectations or that shouldn't be a political goal? Both. Hmm. We should we should manage our expectations. Uh and, and I don't think they're being managed. I don't I, I think everybody has a lot of big ideas about what a what a check will do for them, or you know, what if I get this land back, what it'll do for me, not realizing that the when the other foot drops and you get charged a high tax for that are we going to be able to keep that land are we going to be able to grow on that land will we be given the tools to you know uh amplify you know the rep the the damage um so i i just i've always seen historically when we look at reparations from the empire it's been a trick and mm. i don't think we're thinking about that part you know I, i've been go ahead chief please no, 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 and I, I think where 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 we align and where we saw see each other as kindred spirits is my position is that is that I don't want to I don't want to need I'm I don't want our people to feel the need to look for that check before we find uh, before we spend our time and our energy fighting and looking for that check we need to create the infrastructure we need to create the power within us and inspire within each other the power to support one another so that in the event, let's just say that the empire decides to hand out those checks, that we know what to do with it. We know what to do and how to do for ourselves, with ourselves, by ourselves, so that whatever, where, where, however those resources come into our communities, we're able to handle them appropriately and we have the mindset to use the power within us, between us, amongst us appropriately and effectively. I agree with that. So I'm, 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 I'm. I, I see it a little different. I, I agree. First of all, that whatever happens politically, whatever our political outcomes are, none of it makes sense if we don't develop political consciousness, self love, you know, community, because we can't spend our way or invest our way out of the condition we're in. I, I think we all agree with that. Uh, that on this panel. But at the same time, we also can't get free without having our justice claim met. As, as descendants of slavery, I feel like we're owed a debt. And getting out of that debt will help us get the resources necessary to build the schools, to build the hospitals, to have self-determination. So I think it's both and, not either or. I, I, I think that we're, we've are we been taught to think that it's impossible. I'll give you an example. Remember... I, I remember when we was, to, and I've been doing reparations work for a long time. Um, and I remember people used to be like, well, how we, it's impractical. How are we going to find out who to get the money to? How are we going to get the names and the lists and all of that kind of stuff? People just said it's not a practical goal. And then I remember when we hit COVID and American capitalism was on its knees because people was in the crib. They weren't going outside and they weren't spending. And Trump started writing them that trillion dollar check and he gave a whole bunch of it to Wall Street. But it was like, oh, we need people to spend money. And, and Negroes started getting them spent them, them, them stimmies, right? They started finding real quick who to give money to. They found they found money and they found a system to distribute that money when it benefited America. So I'm thinking if we apply enough pressure, we could get that same thing here now. I, I agree with you. It's not the only thing. And I also think about reparations um, as kind of like as a, as a check for sure. But I also want targeted investments in the communities of the, the Af African American descendants of slavery, right? Like I want, we should all go to college for free. We should all, you know, that's how I'm thinking about. It. In addition to this, I want the check, but I also want this other stuff too. Um, but let me ask you a question, if, 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 if feel free to respond to that. But I guess my question is, what do you see at this moment in in, in history as our biggest needs as a community? What what should we be focused on? What should we be looking at? Well, you know, to me, and, and this will go into responding and answering that question, 
I just really think we, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he asked me why, if you were, if your car was broken into, why would you call the police? Why wouldn't you just handle it in the community and, you know, restorative justice communally? And I said, <laughs> I said, because I pay taxes and I own my house and the police serve me. They are my employees in my mind. Mm. And so I'm not afraid to call the people who my property tax dollars go to to provide a service. And I expect a professional service. And he said, oh, I guess I live on the other side of the law. And I said, that's why you see them as the authority. So, you know, right. you know, so to your point, brother, I kind of look at it like what we need to be doing right now is taking advantage of being the stewards of our community. And I think for far too long, we have left that to other people to choose who the candidate is, to donate to that candidate, to support that candidate, to, to really get into the infrastructure of the institution and take it over to give ourselves back the reparations you believe that we deserve. If we're going to um, uh, the institution that we are not part of the fabric of and asking for restorative work, you're not going to get that. Look at what happened. And we're not even close to reparations. Look at what happened after Brother George Floyd was, was uh, executed. Just asking for justice or equity had such a, a national backlash that we are where we are now, where they like, we don't even want diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they're creating uh, uh, movements against that. If reparations in terms of a check or free education were to be given, you would see a violent response. And so the only way to get away from that violent response is to be part of the fabric of the institutions of our community. And so what do we need more than ever? We need to be involved with more than that isolated uh, kind of black liberation th thought into a more diverse, how do we bring in the brown people? How do we bring in the Venezuelans and make black ideology um, a, a, a bigger thought, more so than a color? It, we have to share values. Mm. What are some of those values? Talk to me about that, Chief Ayanna, and feel free to say yeah. anything else you want, but what are some of those values? Yeah, I think uh, I think we have a, a concept in Yoruba uh, within the Ifa um, uh, uh, traditional practice, Ifa is the is the system of philosophical understanding, spiritual understanding from the Yoruba people uh, of Nigeria, and it's spread throughout its diaspora, throughout the Yoruba diaspora. And Ifa teaches us the importance of Iwa Rere or Iwa Pele, which is balanced character, and balanced character is equivalent to good character. So that would mean that good character is balanced character. And what that, why that's significant and that distinction between what is good is what's balanced is that certain um, um, uh, situations call for certain responses or certain actions to be taken. And empowerment, to be self-empowered, to be empowered within our community, to take back power and control over ourselves, our lives, and then our communities is what I think is going to assist us in keeping um, the values in our community in intact. Education, being in control of our educational systems, being in control of our of our of the way that we we. Uh, manage our communities, the way we support our communities, the way we pour into our communities, being in control of where we invest our, our financial power, be empowering ourselves, being aware of how we spend our political capital, where we, who we invest in, who we share that with, and, and how we make sure that we are taking care of ourselves and taking responsibility and autonomy for ourselves, right? So I think one of the values that uh, we, we, we promote within Ifa, within uh, um, uh, our spiritual wellness uh, practices, is is maintaining a focus on our own 
destiny, what we can control. I can control my thinking. I can control my actions. I can control my words. I can control what I do with myself, for myself, by myself today. I can't control what the next person does. Can't control what the next man or woman does. I can control what I do. And by controlling what I do, I can influence that which is happening around me in concentric circles, first in my home, first in, then in my family, then in my community, and then ex and then um, in, in, in concentric circles outside, waiting all the way out to, to internationally and then internationally. So first, focus on self, knowledge of self, awareness of self, wellness, focusing on our wellness, our well-being, our balance, and then using that to, to make change in, in the world around us. Where do we get um, that knowledge of self from these days? When I was coming up, you know, in Philly, we had black bookstores. I had hip hop, right? I had movements. You know, I remember being at 52nd Street in West Philly where I could turn left and the Ansar Law community was on there giving me books about being new, being in knowledge of self. The Nation of Islam was down the street telling us that we were the Asiatic black man. They were Hebrew Israelites up the way. There was an African centered bookstore around the corner, right? Brand Nubian was playing in the background. You know, I'm being a little, I'm romanticizing it a little bit because there's a whole bunch of other wild shit happening too. But, <laughs> but, but, but there's a way that I had access to knowledge in all these different places. And I'm I'm turning into the, the the old head that be complaining like get off my lawn. But there's a way that now I don't hear it in the music as much. I don't I don't. They're shutting down our, our spaces of knowledge. Um, you know, I, they I, who? I, um, I would say the forces of capitalism. So, for example, you know, as a book, I'm a bookstore owner, and I fight to keep my black bookstore open in West Philly, Uncle Bobby's, and I'm able to do it because we have a generous community that supports us. But the average mom and pop bookstore gets shut down because you can buy the books half price on Amazon. I got people to come in my bookstore. They they they, they say, "Oh man, you got Doctor Ben. Oh, you got John Henry Clark. Oh, it's nineteen ninety nine. Yo, I've always wanted to read this book. They put it back on my shelf. They go to Amazon and get it for nine ninety nine, and then they come back in my store and read it. Right now, I can afford to to make that work, but the average person can't. Um, and I don't blame the person that makes that choice because. Times is hard and they're poor. And I want them to have the knowledge more than I want their, not, their 1999. So we got to figure out, again, it goes back to the point y'all were making about investing in community. But to invest in community, you need money, which to me goes back to the reparations point. So I feel like they're all connected, like the, the need for resources and infrastructure and the need of consciousness. But I guess the thing I'm trying to, the thing I'm struggling with um, is where, where where should we be looking for those, those that, that knowledge and stuff? Now, how do we generate that in this moment? People don't go to church as much anymore. People don't go to masjids as much anymore. People don't join religious movements as much anymore. Like, where do we get it from? Well, you know, I, I'll say this. We're talking about a generational rift that was exacerbated by a pandemic. Uh, but in that crisis is also an opportunity. When we're looking at Gen X, we're looking at the only generation right now that is the bridge between the analog and the technological. And we have to, but the issue with Generation X is that we were also the first to become the mogul. Our parents were the first to get into the middle class. When we came along, it was Jordan, it was Puffy, it was, you know, just the mogul. And, and now we're seeing Generation Xers are like, we're billionaires. So what I see in Generation X is still a lot of the remnants of the belief in capitalism as a way to change our condition. When capitalism is actually B and purpose driven living and morality and values is A. I get into so many debates with people that want to put B before A. What do we have to do, Mark, in terms of your bookstore? You're doing more than selling books. Somebody would be happy to buy that $30 book if they came to your store and had a experience. And so what you had when you grew up, what you described with brand Nubians was an experience. And I think a lot of Generation X, somehow in our moguldom, we never learned how to recreate the experience 
because we got caught up in selling stuff. And now you see our young people only interested in what they can sell and get and trade. And so capitalism becomes more important than value systems, but value systems can be leveraged for capital. And I think that our communities have to, Generation X is gonna be responsible for recreating the values that we were given to our young people, especially in a pandemic that drove everybody inside themselves, inside the house, inside the internet. So how do we bring them back out with experiences that capture the imagination and the soul? You said something about experiences. One of the things you have going on right now, Fest, that, that, I, that I was really excited to hear about is James and Nikki, a conversation. What is that? Well, that feels like an experience. Yeah, you know, um, so, you know, I was seeing on the internet this, this thing going around with Nikki Giovanni, iconic poet, novelist, talking to iconic civil rights uh, uh, activist and novelist James Baldwin, and she was saying stuff, lie to me. You go to work and smile at him every day. Come home and smile at me. I get the frowns. I get the bad stuff. Why Why don't you come home? He said, well, I can't lie to you. She said, you must lie to me. That's the only way we're going to stay together. And I'm like, why is Nikki Giovanni? Don't she know he's gay? <laughs> why is she talking to him like this? But right. in 1971, Ellis Hayslip had a show on WNET called Soul, where they would do culture talks and Nikki Giovanni was interviewing 20 she's 25 years old interviewing James Baldwin who lived in Paris at 52 years old Nikki Giovanni's black power movement James Baldwin's from the civil rights movement but here they are talking like man and wife father and daughter artist to artist freestyling and I said oh boy and I went and looked at that two-hour interview and I said you know Young people aren't going to get this Bible unless we revise it. It needs a King James version. It needs an English version. And so what is that version? Put it in hip hop. Throw it on top of a beat and some drums. Then, then it can't just be me kind of rhyming. Get a female co-author. I don't even call them female rappers. We get a, a let, I need the spirit of Nikki to debate everything that I'm saying, like Nikki debated James, and then add weave in their conversation and, and revive the ancestors. Because what do we know? If there wasn't an autobiography of Malcolm X and a movie about Malcolm X in the 80s, we might have lost Malcolm X in the consciousness of our community. If if King wasn't revived over and over with a with a national holiday that Stevie Wonder sung Happy Birthday and John Conyers was fighting for that holiday for 15 years, Stevie Wonder sung one song, got the holiday passed, and the next year passed Reagan and uh, uh, um, I forgot the other racist senator that said over my dead body. But one year, music brought King back into the national consciousness. So James and Nikki, James Baldwin, Nikki Giovanni, let's not lose them in our consciousness and let's use them to pivot us into the future. We're the fruits of their labor. So I turned it into an album and we did a deal with uh, the Golden State Warriors, Golden State Entertainment, and they put it out because I'm looking like record labels aren't going to do it. Let's leverage this art with sports franchises to make cultural impact in our community. I love how that sounds. Chief Ayanda, talk to me about cultural impact in our community. Uh, what, what I just heard Ron Fest say is making a new translation, re-articulating this through, the, through the, the tongue of hip hop. That sounds dope to me. Um, sometimes I worry, because I'm, I'm at the age now where you know I'm old enough to have kids that listen to hip hop, and I don't know what they're listening to. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, they don't know what they're listening to. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm like, like how 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 do we reach these young people using hip hop or or any kind of musical kind of medium, um, and it not be now that hip hop is multiple generations, and it not just be our yes. hip hop, our our. You know what I mean? Because it used to be you just say hip hop, and it was, we was all talking the same language, but now. If I come up there with some, you know what I mean, with, with some Sadat X, Absolutely. or I come up there 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? It work. <laughs> Yo, so so the thing when I I talk a lot about the intersection between culture, customs, and tradition, right? And so if we understand, even Ron Fest, we was talking about uh, that conversation between James and Nikki. It was a cultural conversation. It was it was a conversation that was grounded and centered in culture, not not topic. It wasn't a topic. It was a cultural conversation. And I think when we think about culture, if we think of culture as the values, the set of values and aesthetics and 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 um, uh, beliefs that bind a community together, that's what they do. Culture binds a community together. And traditions are the mechanisms by which that culture is passed from generation to generation. So hip hop now, because like you said, Mark, it's intergenerational. Now this tradition Right now we can tap into tradition, the way yeah. that we pass down ideology value from one generation to the next. Hip hop now can be the vehicle, can be a vehicle through which to transmit culture, through which to transmit values, right? Because now we can have an intergenerational conversation over time, pass and, 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 and cut through some of these uh, dynamics that create separations between generations. We can cut through that with hip hop. Right. And so James and Nikki is all the way dope because within within James and Nikki, uh, Ron Fest is creating is is creating a conversation that is is recreating a conversation that happened in the past. He's bringing it into the into the present for a generation of people that never understood that may never have been introduced to those great minds, to those great cultural icons. So now they're being reintroduced. So how can we utilize the mechanism and the vehicle of hip hop, use the mechanism, transform this popular music and use it to our advantage, to empower our people, to empower our young people, right? We always say that education is not, is not the things we learn. Education is the way we, are, we are, are taught to learn. Can we learn how to learn? If we can learn how to learn and extract the wisdom from all places around us, from the music, from the art, from the, from the um, uh, conversations that are happening digitally, Mark, this night school is a, prime, is a, a perfect example. How can we leverage this popular uh, 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 vehicle of YouTube? How can we leverage that to be the vehicle to, to teach? One of the projects that I'm working on, um, uh, Sinking Inc. does just yes, that. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, Bring Sinking Inc. I'm super you. excited about you, it. You're the cultural director. You're also the spiritual advisor. And I'd never seen a, a, a project have a spiritual advisor to it, at least that I knew about, you know, other than maybe yeah. Arrested Development. You know what I mean? So, like, break that down for me and tell me what it means and, and sort of how, break it all down for me. It's revolutionary. It's revolutionary. What we're trying to do, what we're deciding to do purposefully is we are empowering our art. Uh, Sinking Ink is a is hip hop theater. It's a it's a it's an extension. Uh, it was written by an amazing writer, Sanguji Kam, and he uh, chose to reimagine theater, reimagine theater through the lens of hip hop, through the lens using in the same ways that other uh, tri um, um, uh, cultural experiences are are after our uh, what's what do I want to say are are utilizing hip hop. They're taking hip hop. They're stealing hip hop, right? To to tell their stories. How can we leverage hip hop to tell our stories? And the story of Sinking Ink is a is a story of a young man who's learning the power of his tongue, the power of his words. It's rooted in Yoruba uh, cultural and philosophy, but it's it's intertwining hip hop and traditional African culture in order to speak to the values embedded in those traditions to speak those values to a, a younger generation and make them modern and contemporary and telling the stories through the lens and through language that our community understands right um so so i'm super excited about that why is it important to have a spiritual advisor and cultural director well because we are we are utilize everybody here has heard of orisha right everybody knows of orisha we hear orisha is popular it's become a popular um uh, a trope even and the characters and the, and the Orisha deities are being turned you know, into actually, superheroes. I don't want to that. Do me a favor, brother, because I got a, I got an international audience and a lot of non-black. Okay. okay, tell them what the what an Orisha is and yeah, yeah. So in Yoruba land, 
uh, which held, which is in Ni Nigeria and Benin, the traditional spiritual practice is Ifa, which is the system by which the Yoruba people understand and a lens through which they see and uh, nature and the natural world understand themselves as part of the natural world. Some people would categorize Ifa as a religion. I choose to say it's a philosophy in a way, a cosmology and a way of life, a lens through which uh, people in Yoruba land understood and um, uh, um, uh, connected to the world around them, to the universe around them. And that tradition of Ifa uh, calls, utilizes these um, uh, uh, essence, the essence, the spiritual essence of natural forces, the spiritual essence of water, the spiritual essence of fire, the spiritual essence of thunder and lightning, the spiritual essence of wind, and, and uses the lessons in the natural world to guide, advise, and, and um, uh, inform the human being as to how to live in harmony with the natural world around them. The Yoruba tradition has, with the, with the expansion and the expulsion of African peoples around the world, the African diaspora, the Yoruba diaspora, um, uh, carried Ifa to Cuba, to Brazil, to Haiti, to uh, Puerto Rico, to the United States. And so the understanding of the Orisha now became part of the fabric of Africanness and African spirituality all around the world. So within, uh, I am I'm a, a Babalao, I'm an initiate of Ifa. And what that means is that I am supporting the community around me in maintaining their balance, in maintaining their connection to the natural sciences and the natural world uh, around them. How do we live in harmony? How do we live in balance? How do we maintain balance within us and around us? Mm. You, you know, I, I want to I wanna, uh, just, just say, I saw one of the guests, Olivia, uh, was talking about mumble rappers. But then when I listened to you and you uh, give us the history of Arisha and um, the spiritual history of the vibration. Um, I, mm. wonder, I wonder, Mark, are we showing our outdatedness with our love for words and our treasuring of words? When you, when I think about what you do, Chief Fayanda, with the rhythm, with the drum, I was in Senegal and some people were drumming and they were laughing because in the drum, they were talking about me around me with the drum and knew what each other was saying. When we think about the young people rapping today, they're rapping to a rhythm, a flow. They don't even write nothing no more. They just, what it feel like. And that reminds me of the G Kundo of Bruce Lee. What is, what's my style? No style, it's just a flow. So when we listen to people like, um, uh, 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 um, you know, any of the newest rappers, Drill, Trap, whatever you want to, you know, do, Amigos, whoever, right? Uh, are they really just connecting with the vibration and we're upset because we don't understand the words? And so it kind of brings... But, but are we sure they do? Uh, my question is just, are we sure that they do? Like, if, if and there's mean? a wide range from Migos to, like, Lil Uzi to, like, you know, like, I guess what I'm saying is, like, is there a powerful spiritual thing happening all the time or is it sometimes... Cats just ain't saying nothing. I think there's always a powerful spiritual thing happening, whether you're saying something or not. Like, you know, there's always a vibration happening and they're feeling each other's vibes. This is an evolution. I think where we got to catch up is to the vibration and not the words. Our generations and the ones before us have always been tricked by words because we didn't understand the spirit of the word. I think mm -hmm. our kids understand the spirit of the word but they don't have the, the, the righteous spirit. And when we catch up with the spirit, then we won't even be mad about the words. We'll just give them the right spirit. Mm. Is it's it the language. Oh. It's language. It's not about the words. It's not about the words. It's about the language and what is being communicated through the vibration, right? Because mm -hmm. the vibration has to be intentional. The vibration yeah. has to be purposeful. And so if there's something that's traveling on the vibration, that the vibration is just the carrier. 
it's just the vehicle that transmits the understanding. Mm -hmm. So if the trans if the understanding is being transmitted, then we have no challenge and we have no issue. The, but the proof is in a pudding. What is the work doing? What is the result? Yes. Right? Because it yes. has to be effective. It has to be purposeful and effective. When it's purposeful and effective, then we see the alchemy. We see the way that we created the change. We see that we created the, the effect that's purposeful and intentional. If not, then, so the language has to be language. What do they say? It has to be, the, 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 the language has to be languaging. You know what I'm saying? It has to be doing that. If it's not, then it's not. Then but but, it's but that also point. depends on where you're at, right? If you're in America, it's not languaging. It's, it's languishing. So, you know, if you, <laughs> I like that. I like that. If you are in Yemen, there was a rapper that started the Arab Spring just by his vibration and, and his protest. If you're in Senegal right now where they're having elections, it is the young people using their art that's leveraging that new kind of political power in Senegal. It's only America where the capitalism interrupts the vibration. When I think about the fruit of, of these vibrations, as y'all are talking about it, it's just so many of these young rappers, and I hate to sound like this dude. I never thought I would sound like this dude, but <laughs> I this is like, but I'm like, we just we're we're killing ourselves, we're killing each other, mm. we're taking so many drugs, we're doing so much harm. Now there's a lot of beauty in hip hop. There's a lot of great stuff happening, but there's this generation of artists coming up, just like there was a generation of artists when we came up that was doing wild stuff. We this ain't the first generation to do it, but it, those same rappers that are mumble rappers and the same rappers that are talking about taking taking perks and, and, and syrup and all this stuff I, i'm not seeing the products you know of these vibrations being positive i'm seeing a lot of self-harm i'm seeing a lot of i'm seeing a lot of community harm um and i'm i'm, I'm worried about them i'm not saying that to, to shame them or to castigate them i'm literally worried that this generation but but isn't it interesting mark that that our generation was the drug dealers and our children are the drug users did we do it to them for sure, it's our fault. <laughs> For sure, it's our fault. That's what I'm saying. I ain't blaming them. And here's the other thing, and this might be my own issue. I genuinely have more have more respect for the drug dealer. I genuinely have more respect for the drug dealer than the drug user. In 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 at the level of at the a, 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 a old head or a homie told me something that an old head said. They were saying he's like he's like the old head of our generation to our generation. And he said. He said, back in the 90s and the 2000s, when y'all was robbing people, y'all was robbing niggas, y'all was locking niggas up. I mean, y'all was y'all was robbing niggas, y'all shooting niggas, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Y'all told us that you had to do it because you had to eat. And we didn't like it, but we understood it. Y'all was robbing niggas, y'all said, y'all was selling dope, y'all said, because y'all needed to eat. We ain't like it, but we understood it. He said, now I see y'all doing it for likes. I see y'all doing it for clicks. I see, it, it's like, there's a way that at a desperation, desperate people do desperate things, right? I worry that we created such a culture that this next generation of folk, even when they're not that desperate or as de de desperate or similarly desperate, they're still making choices that they don't have, that are, that are not helpful and that are actually deeply harmful for our community. So yeah, we created the mess, no doubt. And it's our job to fix it as the, as the elders and as the old heads now. I don't doubt that. But I just don't want to romanticize what they're doing because I feel like I worry that sometimes we can see the harm and romanticize it in such a way that we don't address it because we feel like it's not that bad. And I might sound like the conservative in the room at this moment, but that's that's how I'm feeling at the moment. You know what I'm saying? You? I'm trying to of it. I know. I know, I, know. <laughs> I know. And that's what I'm like. I, I, I hear myself saying it and I'm like, damn. It's what happens when we disconnect the actions from the repercussions, right? Mm. So when we throw a pebble in the pond, we throw the pebble in a the pond, there are rippling effects of that action that are taken, right? And so we don't always know what those rippling effects are gonna do, or are what they're what they are, or how they're going to play out. But we have to know that they are going to play out, right? And so even to to the to that point, it's about empowerment and about being purposeful and intentional in our actions, right? And so so why why have we decided um that desperation is an acceptable, uh, being desperate is acceptable. Once being desperate is acceptable and acceptable, acceptable justification for an action, now that becomes a normalization of desperation. I'm choosing to say, no, 
desperation is not my normal. That's not my that's not my baseline, right? That's the that's the challenge. We're gonna get outside of the challenge, not let that be our norm. But here's the thing: desperation is acceptable because desire was amplified. So when it's like, I don't have this, I don't got that, I crave this, I want to have sex every day, I need more drugs, I gotta pay for it, I got I got anxiety. If I don't take this, mm. if I don't take these perks, bro, my anxiety, like I got depression. Oh my god, like so all of these desires and needs created the desperation. I'm lonely. I don't have friends. Nobody understands me. It puts you in a desperate situation. And so, you know, I, I guess what we have to ask ourselves, brothers, is how do we how do we bring down the craving? How do we how do we manage the desires of our children or what they think they should have? How many young people do you know that are hard on themselves because they don't got a house by 24? Right. right. <laughs> like, you know, we, we our society has too much. And it's hard to tell people they got too much. It's hard to tell somebody they too comfortable. And nobody, you know what I do as an artist, like to make sure that I don't creep into the discontent of elderliness and like become a curmudgeon. I'll always throw myself into an uncomfortable situation that I'm like, why did I do this? that I have to rise to the challenge. But what I find about our young people, everybody, and older people too, everybody's running toward comfort. And that's the problem. We got to learn to be uncomfortable. Like only the growth only comes through the discomfort. Only through the discomfort. It, and it, and, and our, our desperation comes from being comfortable so long that we got to catch up to our comfort when it runs. What role does social media play in sort of compromising our values or, or shifting us away from values that are uh, healthy for us, especially as you talk about this question of discomfort? And the reason I ask that is because you're talking about like how many people feel bad or are hard on themselves for not having a house at 24. And I'm like, yeah, I know people like that. Mm -hmm. But those people don't worry me as much as the people I'm meeting now that feel like they got to all... They, they, they got to pretend that they live in a great a great apartment. They got to pretend that they're eating at the finest restaurants. They got to pretend that they're in VIP at the club. And so on Instagram and all these other places, they they have to create a life that's not there. And then when they turn the camera off, there's a there's a self worth. It's all bound up in this capitalism stuff we're talking about, right? Your value is bound up in how much jewelry you got, even if it ain't really yours. You know, having a certain kind of crib, having a certain kind of experience. You know, I've I've had I've, I've watched people work for work for a courier service you know what i'm saying and they go to the store to pick up a bag or something fancy for the courier service but they stop they pull out their phone they take a selfie with it and i know it's on their TikTok or instagram the next day as if that's the life they're living you know what i'm saying and uh, i mean you, you're a rapper i mean how many times how many times have you seen fans you know, pretend to be in VIP or they ask a rapper for a, a, a selfie. And next thing you know, they on the Instagram, like kicking it with Ron Fest tonight. And it's like, I don't know you. Right. Yeah. But, 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 but what we teach people to perform success and to perform joy and to perform happiness. I mean, you go to rap shows now or R&B shows or, so, you know, and everybody got their phone out and everybody's making content. And it's like nobody's actually feeling double the spirit. Nobody's. It's, connecting spiritually with the music how can you if the whole time you just you you doing selfies and, and, and you and you recording the concert L let me let, let me give you let me give you let me give you an alternative and then i want to ask chief ayanda a question you know i kind of look at it this is the first time in the history of mankind we've had to be two separate people we've had to be dual human beings one that lives in here and one that lives out here and we're and because it's such a new technology we're learning how to be two separate identities at one as human beings um you know i i do think it's a part of evolution uh, I do think we're going to get to telepathy this way. One of the things I see with the technology is that anybody can know anything about you at any given time. It's so hard to lie. And, and the first, what you're talking about is the first thing we're doing is trying to lie. 
but the internet is exposing all lies as well. So no matter what you do to make yourself look like this, somebody's going to find the truth and expose you on this thing. Right. And so, but with that, I think we're going to get to a point where we all just learn to be honest. And once mm -hmm. we all learn to be honest, because it's going to be exposed anyway, we'll be able to vibe with each other and know what we're looking at like better. But what I want to ask you about capitalism, I mean, I keep hearing this. What do you all say when someone like uh, Barack Obama says capitalism is the only system in the history of mankind that lifted the most people out of poverty and famine? Before the system, it may not be perfect, but before the capitalistic system, more people in the world were impoverished and hungry and diseased. Capitalism has saved more lives than it's hurt if you look at it historically. What would you say to that? Because that's what Obama says. <laughs> Obama says a lot of stuff. <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, it sounds good, though, and a lot of people repeat that. It it, it, it it does. I'm going to answer that point, but I also want to, you said something else I thought was really interesting, and I think you're right, that a lot of, you know, there's a way that a lot of people are living a lie, right, with their online lives, right? But there's another way that I think about it sometimes, which is that it's less even that they're living a lie and more that their reality has shifted to that domain. Like, like, like on Ooh. social media, I am the, the shit. whole reality. Yeah. On Instagram, I really am a boss. On Instagram, I really am the shit. So their whole reality is oriented to that Instagram life. And so the physical world, the walking down the street world is less significant and less worthy of engaging. I'm going to just stay online where I can still be the shit. Mm. You know, and, and that's what scares me. Because in that world, it becomes very solipsistic. It becomes very self-absorbed and very self-directed. So that I'm not thinking about community. I'm not worried about if Chief Ayanda is okay. I'm not worried about if Ron Fest is okay. Because I don't have to come by your house and make sure you're healthy. I don't need to make sure your, your kids got education. Because all I'm thinking about is this world that I'm constructing. That's really like a hyper reality. And that terrifies me. Um, but but to your question, you know, I think about, um, I think, of, I always think about Malcolm X when he talks about the victims of American democracy. You know, I, I I agree that, you know, there are certainly benefits for significant portions of the world. Significant, not overwhelming, not majority, but significant portions of the world with capitalism. But for every, um, but capitalism isn't just about, most of the wealth is still concentrated in a very small percentage of the, of the world. And so the overwhelming body of people don't have their needs met every day. They don't have food, clothing, and shelter. They don't have living wages. Um, that concerns me. But capitalism isn't just about the gross number of people who have to live at the margin so that a small number of people can live excellently. It's also about the, the abuse of the environment. We're destroying the environment. We're destroying. There might not be a planet left. Even if, even if we found a way to distribute <laughs> capitalism you know, in a way that made everybody happy, there won't be a planet left. Our bodies won't be healthy. You know, we're losing so much when we use each other as means rather than ends. And I think that's unfortunately uh, so much of what of what capitalism has has become. And that scares the hell out of me. Um, but I could even live at this moment because I'm still pragmatic, even as I'm a, even as an idealist, I'm still a pragmatist at the same time. I could live with a kind of democratic socialism. I could live with a, a, a DSA kind of socialism. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about, I could live in a situation where we just made sure that workers' needs were met, where we made sure um, that private capital didn't control everyone's destinies. I could live with a world where we regulated corporations. I mean, I'm talking about just a, 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 a Bernie Sanders socialism. A fair society. A fair a, society. A balanced Maybe. society. Yeah. Yeah. A balanced society. Mm. Yeah. I think I think the, the 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 state of equilibrium, the natural balance of things is is where we are equally um, uh, concerned 
with that which is inside of us and that which is outside of us. That is happening, that is which is happening within our being and that which is happening around us. That's a balanced society. The truth, going back to the question of the reality of people living on social media, the truth is when I open my eyes, right? When I take the breath of life in my lungs in the beginning of a day, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I experiencing? That's the, that's where this, that's truth, right? A teacher told me, about um uh, gave me an analogy of driving down down a highway driving down a highway and driving down a paved road and having trees on one side and trees on the other side right sometimes we when we live in these urban environments that's you know we we go out into the suburbs and we experience these highways these long highways where the road is paved and there's trees on one side and trees on the other side and and the trees the nature is the truth. The road is false. How do we know that? Because if we don't maintain the road, the trees will take over. <laughs> the trees grow through. The trees, the trees are the truth. The nature, the natural environment is true. That which we don't have to maintain. When we leave it alone to do what it does, there's truth. The road is fake. The road is false. And so if we use that same analogy, this environment that we are that has to be maintained that crashes that 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 we have to log into on a regular basis we log into to the natural environment when we open our eyes in the morning and inspire and expire then we're connected to that which is real and true our challenge is we have to uh, shift back the understanding to the to our community to understand what is real what is truth what is the what is the lie and what is the truth? But doesn't, you know, I got this line on James and Nikki where I say, you know, you try leaning on the truth, but it always bends. I mean, the truth changes. The truth evolves. So, what was true three years ago might not be true today after the break, pandemic. Break that down, because half the room right now, I already know if this was the barbershop, people like, oh, nigga, what you talking? Break this down for me. What does it mean? Because I don't, I don't disagree with you. I just yeah. want to, I want I want you to break it down for the. I audience. mean, the simplest thing is who I was a year ago is not who I am today. So if you looked at me a year ago and say the truth about him is, you would be wrong today. So mm -hmm. you know, the, and and that happens with life. That happens with people and with systems. There, you know, uh, there are certain universal truths, but the truth as we live it every day in the system changes. I'm watching, you know, I had a debate with a friend of mine. He said, America's policy toward Israel is just something that won't change. I said, you must not be looking at the news. Mm. <laughs> you must not be looking at what people are doing and abstaining from voting, period, that's changing U.S. policy before your eyes. The truth is bending. And so if, you know, somebody on here said, if our ancestors didn't believe things could change, which those people who started America thought three-fifths of a people, that's who they are. That is the truth, and it'll be that way. Well, we've proven them wrong. We've, we've bent that truth. So, you know, I got a question. About truth, I'm always cautious. I have a question. Who said that the truth can't change? Right? Someone who says that the truth can, is not malleable, maybe our understanding of the of what is truth needs to adjust. Maybe change is truth. Truth is change. And to expect truth to not change, to expect truth to be rigid, that's the error. The error mm. the because nature is truth. Nature is going to change. Nature is going to, there's going to be evolution and transformation. I don't disagree with that, right? I agree with that at the philosophical level. I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I always believe in sort of provisional truths. You know, things are things are true uh, until they're not. Things are true uh, in the moment. Things are true based on context. Um, but I worry in practice that that philosophy lets people off the hook. It lets people who enter social justice work decide that, well, my truth changed, the truth changed. You know, now I need to become an investment banker. Oh, I was a conscious rapper, but now, you know, I need to be a billionaire. 
But I no, I like that because Mark, guess what? It allows them to be agile with the changing environment. You know, how many times has somebody who was a hero become a villain or a villain become a hero? And we have to allow for the agility of things to, to do that and know the spirit that we're moving in. But but also some people lie to themselves. Oh, yeah. That's Thank true. <laughs> then they were never truthful in the first place, right? And so you can't, ah. you can't, call, you can't call a liar. You can't expect a liar to be truthful, right, at all. So we're That's not the, talking about the liar. So so I, I, I'll give you an example. If, if you have a relationship with Kanye, you know, mm. um, I remember watching him on Drink Champs maybe, uh, maybe last year. And he basically said um, that the whole backpack conscious thing was never something he was actually into, that that was all just a hustle to get to where he is now. I don't believe that. Why I don't I, because then I would have to want to believe, believe it. <laughs> like, um, is that I mean, the truth? I, I, I'd like to believe that he was sincere at the time, and 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 truth his his truth has changed, and that he wasn't lying to us, but that he simply shifted. Um, but it's possible. I mean, what, 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 how would you respond to somebody like that who goes from backpack rapper to being really proud to be a billionaire? Well, I'm a backpack rapper, and he had backpack rappers around him. What Kanye, I think, what Kanye understands is how to uh, live in the truth to evolve to the next purpose that he has. So whatever the truth of the moment is, he can encompass that to get to the next stage. Uh, so, you know, um, Kanye's mom, you know what I notice about people like this? Nobody comes from nothing. His mom, Dr. Donda West, Fulbright scholar, master in Russian poetry. They lived in China from five till he was 10 and he learned to speak Mandarin. He got a he got a scholarship to go to the Arts Institute, but said, no, I'm going to I'm going to change that narrative and do it through this mode of of hip hop, you know. Um, and I need these people around me to do it. And when I want to evolve. I'm going to have these people around me so I become this. You know, when, when I saw him going through the Christian stage, I saw who was around him that helped him mold that truth of the Christian stage. Now they are gone. It's another stage. So sometimes your entourage uh, um, depicts what your truth of the moment is. Who are you hanging around? That's your truth. Does that, but we got to be, a little firm though, right? Because if we're too malleable, then anybody we're around will just will just become that thing. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Is is he too I mean, malleable? <laughs> is he too malleable? Uh I don't know. I don't know. I I um I think that he's another, he's an anomaly. And so when we're talking about anomalies, we're talking about something that is to look and learn from from all of the truths that he's going through. This is something that someone who's living either or each one of those evolutions can learn something in that space that he's in at that moment. And what's incredible about that, that's true art. Maybe the art is what's true of it. His life is an art piece. And you can look at all the different lives and versions of his truths. And no matter where you are in your stage of life, there's something to learn from it. Does it ever scare you? You know, brothers, what's go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. making me think of is making me think of is making me think of just the baking of a of a cake, mm. right? The baking of a cake. If you if you examine that cake at any uh, while it's in process of development, it's not going to be the finished product, right? It's mm. not going to be the finished product. We it's it's in process, and a life, a human being who is. Um, evolving and is growing is in process of becoming the full expression of himself, right? And so if you look in the middle and examine it and be like, ah, it's not done. It's not what it's supposed to be because it hasn't completely become what it's supposed to be until we look back on it and see the journey that it's taken. But but chief, what what if I what if I what if I take that little toothpick and I I taste the cake halfway through and I taste salt or garlic. And I'm like, this is supposed to be chocolate cake. 
this ain't gonna turn out right. Like sometimes there's indicators that something is not going in the right direction. Yeah, but you right. said it was. But you knew the chocolate cake. Fair. <laughs> like, yeah, and if, if you if you're the one who baked it and you didn't intend to put the, the garlic in the chocolate cake, then that was an error that you made, right? That's not the cake's fault. Right. And that's right. what I noticed even about bro. Like, a lot of people put their ideologies on him and get upset when the truth that they learned from him has evolved into somebody else's thing. So, you know, so I, I saw one of your uh, guests uh, said, he's mentally ill. Why don't we just say that? And in my mind, I said, well, wasn't Da Vinci mentally ill? Wasn't, uh, who's the guy that did the wooden airplane? What's his name? Oh, I'm not sure. The, the, Ar they did art, is not my, art is not my... Uh... No, no, not an artist. He was an airplane builder, and he built the wooden air. They did a movie about him. But, you mm. know, most, most brilliant people throughout history, and I would even be willing to throw Jesus Christ in there, the people of their time were like, boy, that person is mentally ill. And so, you know, I don't really buy into that. I just think that you, when you, we you don't buy into anybody being mentally ill, or just him. Um him. Because okay. there are some things I because I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I view that type of sickness. Hitler was mentally ill. When it turns into extreme violence, when when you're hurting other people physically and really saying, I'm going to destroy the world and moving on that, there's a sickness. There's a sickness and something has to be done about, you know, where I draw the line is violence. So anything short of violence for you might not be mental illness. Might not be mental illness. It might just be a misunderstanding. So <laughs> I de I definitely agree. I, I definitely think that I definitely think that there's, you know, I don't I never sat and talked to the brother yay. So I don't I, I can't I can't say what what is mentally I can't diagnose him. I can't give make give my impression. I never sat and talked with the brother. I only know what we see, right? And what what is perceived from the outside. So it would be irresponsible for me to put on to someone else my understanding of what they should be shouldn't be what they're doing what they're not doing if i'm not talking to him directly so i can't speak to that but what i can speak to is the concept uh the context of balance if some if uh if balance is our optimal state right balance is our optimal state then when we find ourselves too much of this or too much of that we find ourselves out of balance and in that out of balance we find rash and what seems to be irrational behavior Right. And so the 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 illness occurs when we find ourselves out of that state of of equilibrium, out of that state of balance. Now, for different people, it's going to be different things. And I think that's what what uh, will determine ultimately if we could say that someone is mentally ill, if they are not in a state of balance or if or, or what the state what the nature is. I can't say that because I don't know the brother. I haven't sat and talked to him. I, if, mm -hmm. if, if I take what you're saying, Fess. Or, or at face value and that it's simply a matter of the influences and who's around do you ever try to pull them closer to you no because that's not my responsibility <laughs> like my responsibility I mean, just on some friend stuff just on some like I hey see. hey you know I, I got this lyric boy i'm gonna keep bringing up these lyrics why i say you know when people jump in my dm talking about save your friend Imagine trying to tell Mandela not to go to the pen. Imagine trying to tell Malcolm Bowties ain't in. Imagine trying to tell Jesus not to die for your sins. Imagine leaning on the truth when it always bends. That's how it is, and it's always been. So, you know, for me, there's a community that I can really put my talents and gifts toward and shape young people. I'm not, you know, these, my peers, man, are my peers. They got their vision of what, community should look like however these young people haven't had the benefit of our experience to really develop their vision and ideas of the future that's where my investment is going that that, that makes sense let me ask you another question because you mentioned billionaires earlier moguls and who emerged and I, obviously there's a lot of conversation going on right now about diddy mm. um when you hear these stories when you hear the lawsuits the allegations the raids all this stuff as somebody who's been in the industry what, what was your initial response you know 
I'm skeptical when they send the the GI Joe after you, you know what I'm saying? And it's like no charges and you know, they're looking for the crime. And uh based on a rumor, to me it just seems like they're looking for a crime. However, what when I grew up, it's so interesting what was acceptable at a certain time that's being prosecuted now, right? So like when I was growing, it took Black Lives Matter to make me realize how unacceptable police brutality was. Because mm. when I w was growing up, it was normalized. But when I experienced the Black Life Matter movement, I was like, oh, that ain't right. You know what I'm saying? Like, wait, we, you know, and now in the neighborhood, you don't see as much police brutality as you used to after that movement. Are we going to go back and prosecute all those police? when we didn't realize you know so there was acceptable violent hypersexualized gender-based violence uh you know think about the things end up you know i was talking to dr dre one time and i played him a, a, a song and, and he said i don't like it and i said why not he said it's too positive music should only be for entertainment and to dance to your stuff has got too much of a message in it I said, but you, I said, you guys were positive. He said, what, uh, F the police, express yourself, two songs. And when he said that, it clicked to me. Oh, my God, y'all was the most negative group in the world. You guys were saying stuff people can't say now. You, oh, you the, were the worst. The misogyny, I mean, the misogyny alone in NW. And again, I, I thought NW. Oh, they were women. talking about killing women. They were talking about beating up people's fathers. They were talking, it was the worst. And the way we've made the music and kind of, it even made my mind think, no, nah, you're a hero. So we're going back now and we're prosecuting people for what we accepted. All of us accepted it. All of us are guilty for R. Kelly. All of us are guilty for Puffy. You think people didn't see R. Kelly up at the high school? I'm from Chicago. We accepted it. They played his records on the radio. They knew it. So when we process, what do I think but about the, it? But the difference I think is, we're not all taking accountability for the culture we created and what we accepted. What, what would accountability look like in the case of Diddy? Because I feel you on the on the R. Kelly thing. Not only even after there were videotapes, people still bought Chocolate Factory. People still <laughs> listen to the singles. People were still, you, you know, what I mean, going to music. listening. To, yeah, I mean, it, it was a very specific thing with him. And have people. you noticed this? Artists always tell the truth. And when he get on and Leo asks for a white girl, he talking about himself. Or the Pied Piper leading the children, he talking about himself. Or Bill Cosby, a gynecologist in the basement of his house. That was the joke. He was doing it. Like, so, you know, right. but, there's but, always but, truth in the art. But, 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 with, but with Puff, the average fan didn't know. And I'm not, I don't, I don't know any of the allegations. I don't, I can't speak to the, Mm. the veracity of any of the allegations but there's a lot of allegations of sexual misconduct of domestic violence of harassment etc right um those of us who not who are not in the music industry or those of us in the 90s who were just listening to it on the radio we had no idea about any of this stuff being being talked about now stories are coming out as industry insiders did john did were y'all hearing the stories about puff I, I I I'd never got close to that part of the industry. That was I can't really speak on that because yeah. it wasn't my thing. To your point, I'm brand Nubians. I'm Wu Tang Clan. I'm you know rap has such a balance. You could be oh I'm over here with the Fugees. Like what they doing is the shiny suit thing. I'm listening to J Ru the Damager. So you know uh, maybe Ye could speak to it better than I could. Because I was never attracted by the lifestyle. Mm. Is there, when you enter the game, is is there a choice? Is it like a fork in the road kind of situation where it's like, yes. I could go down there? Yes. Yes. It, but now there's less of a fork in the road. It's just a butter knife. <laughs> 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 it's just a butter knife bro because it's only one way to go up you think you know we were talking before we got on about how this is literally sharecropping for artists it's it's jim crow uh streaming yeah. is jim crow you're literally sharing and cropping and you'll never pay for that shovel you'll never pay for that studio time you'll never so 
we have to change what music the success or what we view success in music as if we want to be working artists now your music is only a commercial for your product so now you got to think what is your product stevie wonder didn't have to sell harmonicas you may have to wow <laughs> that's oh, wow Chief Ayanda, I mean, you, you, you've you toured with some of the greatest artists in the world. You've worked with some of the greatest artists in history. Does that scare you when you hear that? It definitely does. I think I'm, I'm, I, I always found myself, I was always the youngest person in the room, right? You know, I was always the youngest one. I was always influenced by the elders that were in that space doing it. So I was, I was the, the, the baby um, being poured into uh, in that, in that. So what that means is that I was looking at, I was looking at examples of uh, from the generation before me, from those who were older than me, right? And so I was not working with my peers. I was not working with contemporaries. So what was poured into me is the wisdom that came from those before me, right? So so my experience is, is I, I call myself a traditionalist because I'm looking at the ways in which the traditions and the values and the culture was passed on to me and how I can pass those on to, the, to those coming after me. So, so my peers, my peers were were um, uh, were the ones who who absorbed the traditional teachings, who understand that, who understood themselves as Africans in the Americas, who understand themselves as spiritual beings having a physical existence. They those were those were the people that I that I grew up around, and those were those were the people that I broke bread with and shared space with. And so the who, who other, were some of those elders, Chief Ayanda? Oh man, my 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 father was was a, a master percussionist with with uh, Mr. Harry Belafonte. Um, oh, I grew up uh, I grew up with Mr. B as as you know my grandfather passed before I was born. So Mr. B and Mr. Randy Weston were my grandfathers, and Ooh. they were they Ooh, were so blessed who were uh, all the way blessed, all the way blessed, and so my understanding of what it meant to be an artist my understanding of what it, what the responsibility was of wielding the the keeping the attention of an audience having an audience pay attention and hang on your every word or your every note or your every expression what 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 is the responsibility that comes with with that what do you owe the community who shares and pours into you those were the kind of lessons that i heard excellence setting the bar high what is supposed to be, Mister? I'll tell you a story about Mister Belafonte. Um, um, I I would be the the young boy hanging out in the rehearsals uh, with Mister B, and Mister the band would rehearse. And the band would come up with ideas, and Mister B would come in the space and listen to what the band was doing and say, "Pause," and say, "What's supposed to be happening here? What is the intention behind this eight bars?" What's the intention behind this vamp? What are you trying to communicate? And if the band, if the if the musicians couldn't articulate that and express what was supposed to be happening, then it was scrapped onto the next, right? Mm. Come up with another idea, right? And so in that regard, the music was purposeful. The art was purposeful. The art was functional. It was the carrier for a message. And and the, what that message was, what that what was intended to be um, uh, communicated. If it was not being communicated, then it was scrapped, and you got to go on to the next, right? Mm. And so, and that there's a responsibility. There's a there's a responsibility that the artist has to their audience, to their art form, to their community. That I think goes back to what tradition is. So when you ask me, um, when you ask me what how, what was it like being around those musicians, it meant you better be on your you better be on your ish. You know what I'm saying you better know what you're trying to do. You better be clear about, and you better be skilled and talented at expressing that 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 thought or that idea in that moment. Chief, I, I, I know, brothers. It's funny when we talk. I said I asked them. I said, "Yo, can y'all give me like 20 minutes?" And they said, "Yeah, we could make it happen for you." You know, and and, and Fess said when him and uh, Chief Ayana start talking, 20 minutes turns to hours. And I'm looking here. We've been talking for <laughs> an hour and 20 minutes, and and I could talk to y'all for another hour and 20 minutes, but I got to get to the. Uh, I gotta get to my Gaza update before midnight, brothers. But I, I, I just I want to thank y'all for for coming through. Uh, y'all gotta come back through. Um, it, this, Absolutely. This this is what I created night school for is just to have family, just building, just talking, 
Mm. You know, no scripts, no no sound bites, just real conversation. Chief Ayanda, how can people support you? How can people reach out to you? What what what, what do you need? I'm on, I'm on I'm on IG, um, a Chief Ayanda Clark on okay. Instagram, on on Facebook. Uh, you can follow me. My my organization is the Fadara Group. T H E F A D A R A Group. Uh, so you can follow us there. I'm super excited. Please look up, uh, check us out at sinkinginc.com, S-Y-N-C-I-N-G-I-N-K.com. And uh, if you're in the New York area, come through. We're going to be at the Apollo Theater from May all the way, Apollo's new Victoria stages from May all the way through through August. So yeah, check out check out the way hip hop is being used to communicate and, and traditional values and ideology. Oh, I, I love I love that y'all. Hold on one second, cause I there's a typo on that thing. I don't want people typing the wrong thing in there. We got one eye. So sinkinginc. dot com family. Make sure y'all check that out. Chief Ayanda on social media on IG sinkinginc. dot com. Make sure you check that out. Ron Fest, I know you got a million things going on. Uh, people should go to Spotify. Yeah. Check out the the, the 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 James and Nikki project. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. On all platforms. So oh. on all platforms, check out James and Nikki. Or come visit me at Ryan Fest on Instagram uh, for more music. And I'm also running for uh, school board in Chicago. This is the first election Chicago has ever had for an elected school board as a major city. Our school board controls over $10 billion in resources a year for our schools. And I'm serving the community that I live in, uh, the 10th district. You can go to Ryan Fest for CPS. If you're more interested in the politics, if you're interested in the music, visit me at Ryan Fest on Instagram. And I and I heard y'all mayor ain't giving doing y'all no favors these days. Oh man, I love this mayor. He come from the neighborhood. Yo, you know, Chicago, man, we got a history of liking strong men and dictators. So we dealt with Mayor Daly for over 50 years. We dealt with Rahm Emanuel and loved it. When people come in and they dictate to us, we love that. Uh, Brandon Johnson has an empathetic voice and we kind of don't respect it. And so, you know, I want to bring back divine masculinity and I'm in line with all of those who are kind and divine grace. I like Brandon Johnson. He come from the neighborhood. Okay, I've been hearing some different stuff from activists, but yeah. I- I, I ain't there, so I can't I can't speak to it. So yeah. well, I, activists always got to have something to bump into. That's how we grow. I hear that. <laughs> I hear that, my brothers. So good to see y'all, man. Love y'all, brothers. Uh, let's talk soon. All right. Love. Absolutely. Thank Respect. y'all. Love you, yeah. Ayanda. Peace. You already know, bro. All right. Peace. Family, that was a hell of a conversation, man. I'm so honored. I'm so uh, proud to have been sitting here with my dear brothers. Uh, who, um, who first of all, just generously gave over an hour at a time, but the conversations, the building about everything from reparations to art to music, to some of these other topics uh, was amazing. And again, um, that's the point of night school, man. We share, we grow, we challenge each other and it ain't TV. So, you know, there's no, there's no sound bites. There's no scripts. We just rock. We just rock. I know I said we had a lot to go on tonight. Obviously, um, we can't cover uh, everything uh, tonight. We can't uh, go over everything. But what we're going to do is tomorrow night, I'm going to do a special night school. I normally don't do Fridays, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up uh, next Friday or tomorrow, this Friday, uh, and have a full conversation about all the topics we didn't cover tonight. They will last till tomorrow. Uh, and and we'll go from there. But right now, I want to uh, pivot uh, to our Gaza update. So what I want y'all to do, uh, I'm going to log out of this. I'm going to end this conversation, but we're going to come right back uh, in a different room for our Gaza update, day 181. So stay here. Uh, but before I go real fast, I want to thank everybody who has generated to the uh, gen- who has donated to this space so generously. Um, so many people bought memberships. You know, I can't shout all of you out, but I, I shouted you out during the during the uh, during the broadcast. But you know, Chad Zichterman, Kimi Avio de Acosta, uh, you know, um, Omega joined and rejoined. I appreciate that. Sabrina Lee made a generous contribution. Uh, Bullet the Bunny gave five. Farage was generously donated a membership. 
Rachel donated five jerseys. See, Shada donated. Odette donated. Meg uh, donated five. This is what keeps the channel going. Uh, I'm grateful um, for everybody who was able to do that tonight. So um, I appreciate it. If you haven't done anything yet, hit the like button. Hit the like button right now and just let us know um, that you're rocking with us. It lets the you it matters to YouTube when y'all are liking the content. I also would ask that you hit the subscribe button. If you've never subscribed before to the channel, hit the subscribe button right now so that you can become part of what we do. Also hit that little bell for notifications. And if you're so inclined, like so many people are doing tonight, hit the join button. We got new members who've joined, just Kaplan joined tonight. I drew them a uh, ayúdeme a olvid olvidarla. Ayúdeme a olvidarla. Ayúdeme a olvidarla. Quiero olvidarla. No sé qué es eso, pero no me importa. Um, ayúdeme a olvidarla. Has, has joined. Ayan Abu, Abu Abukar has joined. Uh, this is so important that people join the channel. And for some of you who just want to make a donation to the channel, who just want to support us financially, please go to Cash App, MLHTV. Again, dollar sign MLHTV. When you go to MLHTV right now through Cash App and make a donation, it helps us support uh, the channel. It helps us invest in the channel. It helps us build uh, the channel. So um, that's important. That's important. Uh, we're putting up new content. We have bookers who book guests like the ones you just saw. Um, we have editors who edit the, the video footage on a daily base. Um, um, there's so much. Um, there's so much going on. So many people are, are sending me notes telling me what I drew the mail olvidar. I, I know what it means <laughs> in, in, in English. What I was saying is I didn't know what the it was that they wanted to forget. It could be olvidarla, like forget her, or it could be olvidarla, like forget it uh, with the feminine pronoun. But what I meant was I don't know what uh, this person's it is. You know what I mean? Is it a memory? Is it a person? Is it a bad experience in Glee Club at college? I don't know. That's what I was saying. But anyway, um, thank you all for the, for the help. I really do appreciate it. Pero hablo español con fluidez. Era profesor de español en una escuela secundaria de antes. So, like, that ain't the problem. Um, pero it seems like everybody here speaks Spanish, which is dope. Uh, we got to do some stuff. We got to do some... Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at Change Wave, too. Um, um, thank you all for watching. Um, if you can make a donation, I appreciate it. If you can't, just hit the like button. Just hit the subscribe button. Uh, but stay with me. Next up is our Gaza update. We'll be on uh, in about two minutes or three minutes, right at 12.05 uh, Eastern time so that um, um, so that we can get, get it going uh, and have a conversation about all the things that are happening in uh, Gaza right now and throughout the, the sort of diaspora in terms of diplomatic developments, humanitarian concerns, policy changes, as well as those raw uh, numbers. Uh, that we need to unpack. So I want to thank you all for watching and I will see y'all later. Peace.